Good morning. My name is Tom Schmidt, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Sales for APC. We're pleased to welcome you this morning to our webinar, hosting two great speakers, Dr. Jose Sanchez Vizcaino and Dr. Joe Crenshaw. I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about housekeeping for the webinar. We thank you very much for your attendance today. Please add any questions or comments that you may have into the chat feature of Zoom during the presentations. We will direct these questions to the appropriate speaker for answers at the conclusion of the presentation during the question and answer period. I wanted to take a few minutes and just introduce APC. We were established in 1981. We're a global business is headquartered here in Ankeny, Iowa, the central, central part of the US. We are the world's largest producer of spray dried functional proteins. We have global research, marketing and selling into the production livestock and agro business industries. We do have a dedicated commitment to research with over 600 published peer-reviewed studies focused on various applications in the global market, heavily weighted in the swine and biosafety areas. We do have 17 manufacturing facilities located globally. These are dedicated to either porcine or bovine production of functional proteins. And these are strategically located to ensure a timely supply of products to all regions and the industries we serve. Thank you. With that, I want to introduce you today to the two speakers, Dr. Jose Manuel Sanchez Vizcaino. Dr. Dr. Sanchez Vizcaino has more than 240 scientific publications and high impact international journals. He is the author of 47 chapters in internationally renowned books. He has been the IP of more than 150 national and international competitive research projects and the director of 34 doctoral theses. He has been awarded the Medal of Merit from OIE. His current scientific interest is focused on the study of the epidemiology and preventative medicine of infectious diseases of animals, as well as the development of new diagnostic techniques new generation vaccines, and new strategies for their control. He is currently the coordinator of the EU VACDIVA project for a safe and effective vaccine against ASV DIVA. Our other speaker this morning will be Dr. Joe Crenshaw. He is the Vice President of Technical Service for APC. After earning his PhD in swine nutrition, Dr. Crenshaw embarked on a career spanning 35 years in the swine industry, including teaching, research, and development, and private consulting in agricultural development. At APC, he has over 20 years of experience providing technical service for customers. Dr. Crenshaw conducts product development and application research with an emphasis on the safety and efficacy of spray-dried plasma. He has been an invited speaker at numerous global conferences and has authored more than 100 publications. With that, we will start the webinar, and I am pleased to turn it over to Dr. Jose Manuel Sanchez Vizcaino for his presentation. Okay, can you hear me now, everybody? Yes, huh? very well, very well. Okay, beautiful, beautiful, thank you very much. So thank you very much for the invitations to share with you all uh, these presentations and to have a good time with all of you. I really thanks very much the invitations and as uh, our speaker told already, I'm going to tell you how is the situation of ASF around the five different continents and what can we do in case that we want to protect it ourselves or what will be our future? 
So this is the agenda that I prepared for you today to review the global situation of the ASF, to review the current risk, because the risk is changing almost every day. What can we do to reduce the risk of ASF introductions? How can we protect it ourselves and what we need? What is uh, important of the early detection that is very critical, the early detection to have a good diagnosis, uh, as well as a good contingency program? How is the ASF Bardiva vaccine current situations? Uh, I'm going to tell you about in general how is running the vaccine for ASF and in particular of the projects that I am the honor to lead is the European Union project for the vaccine. And finally, to answer your question or comments. Again, thank you very much for the invitation and good morning to everybody. So I, I am working in, in African swine fever since 1978. And this is the worst situation I never saw in my life. Never I saw the five continent affected with African swine fever like now. So since the 2007, that probably you remember was the last exit of the virus from Africa. They in particular, they live in this occasion from uh, this, the East Coast of Africa. They touched Madagascar, is a boat. They went by a boat and they went to the Caucasus. So that's in 2007. So since 2007, already five continents are affected. More than 50 countries and at least eight epidemiological scenarios different. So this is the real situation. The last continent affected, as you know, is very near to all of you. And this is a Dominican Republic and IT. So the, the virus is already there. So in general, I have to tell you that in 2007 was the last time lived. Now we are 20, 21, so 14 year. And this, the disease was not a stop at all. Is a, a disease that is spread almost every day. We have new areas affected. And one of the reasons why I think that's happened is for two reasons. One is that the disease is underestimated. And the second is that it's not well known. In particular, the mechanism of transmission as well as the resistance of these viruses, very, very resistant as you're going to see. So let me very quickly to show you how are the different continents affected and how is the situation. It started for Africa, but as you know, was the where African swine fever was festival describer. So we have two different big different scenarios. One is the East and South Africa, and the other one is the West Africa. West Africa will be relatively easy to control, but the East and South Africa, the situation is quite different. That is the area where it has been reported for first time in Kenya in 1921, African swine fever. It's also the place where all the different viruses that we characterize as genotypes, we have a total of 24 genotypes already. All of them are living in this area. And also in this area are living these guys that I show you here. This is the, this is the bush peaks, this is the facochero, and also they're living with this vector. This ve vector is Ornithodorus, but in particular Ornithodorus mubata. This, these animals have the, the capacity to infect themselves with African swine fever, but the virus never reach the virus higher than 10 to two. So these animals have uh, one type of tolerance to the ASF infections because they can deal with the African virus and don't have lesions that put and trouble their life. But they are carrier of the virus. With 10 to two, they still have the virus around the body. So what happened in this situation? In these situations, these vectors, the Ornithodorus mubata, have the possibility to bite one of these animals with 10 to two and amplify the virus themselves because the virus is multiplied in this and this Ornithodorus, and they move to 10 to 2 to 10 to 7. So that is a high amount of virus, as you know, and there is give, able to infect it not only wildlife, but also domestic life. And this cycle is what is happening already that continuously are all the virus around and all the time infected wild and domestic, wild and domestic, thanks to this vector. 
So this selvatic and domestic cycle is coexistent, and this is the reasons why we have to stop also the disease here, unless that we want we don't want to have more release from from this plant place of the world. So this is one of the biggest problem that we have. The situation in Europe is, is quite a little more, more, more normal, no, not that too much trouble like in this other area. But in, in, in Europe, we have two different scenarios that are completely different as well. We have in the, in the East countries of, of Europe, uh, including some of the European Union, we have most of the infection in domestic domestic here in red. So our infection is in domestic with also wildlife infected. The reasons why here is very frequently to have that is because in, in these areas, there is a, a lot of farms with very low biosecurity and also backyard production. So that is the reasons why here is quite complicated as you're going to see a little later. Now we also have the West area of the European Union with most of our countries are located, what is exactly the opposite situation. We have a lot infection in wild boar and blue and, and relatively few in domestic. And I'm going to explain you why this domestic is still uh, have trouble. I'm going to show you and why wildlife is so complicated as well. So the good news that we have in the European Union where you see many, many, I mean, European and Europe in general, as you see, many countries are affected, starting in Georgia in 2007, as I mentioned to you, and the last ones was Alemania, Germany in 2020. And the, the good news that we have recently, some of them a little longer in the time, was Czech Republic, that they eradicated totally the disease from their territory, as well as our colleagues from Belgium. Both of these the countries did a fantastic job, and they are already free. And, and declared by OIE as a free. And also we have very soon, I hope, the Sardinia. They, they started in 2015 to 220, a beautiful eradication control program. They found where the virus has been normally stable, that was in the free ranging peaks. And since the last two year and a half is no outbreak at all in domestic or in wildlife. So I hope that soon is going to be declared. So the situation in, in, in our territory is uh, between 2014, because this is where the infection start in the European Union in the 2014. And we have between 2014 to 2021. So in this seven year, we have already at present a 37% of the European countries affected. So 10 to of 27 and are affected with African swine fever in domestic and also in wild boar. In domestic, as you can see, the figure are very slow and very small, 5,353 uh, domestic farm affected. And wild, in wildlife, we have a big, big amount of infection cases, notification of cases, 380,875 80, wild boar are affected. So as I mentioned at the beginning, our problem, our real problem at this moment in the European Union area is the 87.9% of the wild boar against the 12.1% in domestic. What is the reason of that? What, what is the reason? The reason is that wild boar is in all the different, in the different areas of the European Union. We have, of course, a lot of more in the natural areas but still the number of outbreak there is a 64%. So the virus is already in the natural areas since one time ago and is still in a very high proportion. But if you move to the agroforestry area, in the agroforestry area, you found that the still we have a 20% of outbreak of wild boar. So that means that the contact in the agroforestry areas with the wild boar infected and the domestic is very high, but even in the agro urban area, we also have outbreak of wild boar. So that's prove you that the wild boar really have a, a very large distributions in our territories that affected from the natural areas to the agroforestry areas, as well as agro urban areas. So the, the, of course, the more number of cases 
of wild boar affected is in the natural areas, but these two are very important. And these are the ones that created trouble in, in domestic farm. So if you look now this summary, you can see that in, in the case of wild boar, we have, uh, as I told you, 68.1 in the natural areas, 11 only in domestic. But I said only, but this is also important to take in, in to take account because you know 11% of domestic affected in in the areas of natural areas mean that we are we have farms in the habitat of the wild boar, and that means that it's going to be very difficult to protect this this percentage of uh, of farms. So we 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 have to think in and the relocation of this farm outside of the natural areas. In the agroforestry, as I mentioned to you, we have a 30% in wild boar, but 80%, of course, this is normal in the in domestic. And in the urban areas, we have a 2% on wild boar and a 10% of domestic. So the important here to detect it, you to summarize, is the biggest problem we have is wild boar, but we also should have a little uh, information and, and to probably change the location of this farm in this area, the domestic one. And here we still have to increase, increase security in some of the countries as I'm going to show you a little later. So this is the summary that uh, I already show you, but the picture is 68, 11, 80, 30, 10, 2. So now we are moving to another area where it's really very complicated, very complicated the situation in here, and this is due to several factors. One of them is that they started uh, and they published in 2021, they, uh, they, they, they found lower virulence ASF strain circulating in Africa. They also, they, they, they at the beginning, they thought that that kind of, because there was most, mostly mutations, could be probably due to mutations, due to the, the virus that infects so many million pigs, and that could be the situations. But later on, they found, a little later, they found that they also found seven genes election virus circulating in the area, but is not probably very much related with the natural mutations and more with uh, some kind of human election genes. But later, even is, is getting worse because they are, at the beginning, there was only circulating virus from genotype one, but now they found also viruses from genotype two. So the situation at this moment in Asia, in particular in China, is where I have, where I, I, I am describing all these things, particularly in China, the situation is very complicated. As you see, this is all the countries affected already. From 28 countries, 16 are already affected. And you can see that China is really uh, very much affected. There's no regions with no ASF at this moment. Other countries as well, including some of, of Oceania as well. And as I mentioned to you, they started describing attenuated virus isolation in seven provinces in the second half of the 2020. At the beginning, by mutations and the election of the CD2. So that could be by natural mutations. But later on, they found seven genes election viruses that was circulating in these three provinces, that that means that uh, there is very difficult to think in that the natural uh, mutations became, uh, I mean, make seven genes election. So in this situation, they also find that this, uh, this isolase was not hemoabsorbing, that as you know, the not hemoabsorbing are lower virulence, but they still have transmissions. Also the incubation periods were longer, and they have partial death. So even that is attenuated, the death is still there and subacute and chronic form. So they complicate also the situation to detect the disease in an early point of view because the chronic form of the disease is more complicated than the acute or, or subacute because the lesions in chronic are a little more complicated to, uh, you know, to, to link with ASF. So that is a complication for, for our colleagues from China, for all the farmers in China, but also the, the running so many uh, strains, different running in, in, in the country 
is, is worse for, for the rest of the world as, uh, as well. So this is where they found more recently in these areas that I, I have here in pink color, they found in these areas, not only the, the, the genotype two uh, viruses and virulence and now attenuated that I mentioned already, they found these new viruses that belong to another type of, of genotype is the genotype one. And these viruses are the ones that has been in Portugal, in Spain, in the past, still in Sardinia. This genotype one is not the one of the virus that is circulating now in, in, in Europe and is not circulating in, the, in, in other places. So how they found that? They found that the, what they call probably uh, ASF fake vaccine in 2019, they, they put uh, the label, this vaccine from uh, as labeled from Harvey Veterinary Research Institute, but absolutely was not right, real, was illegal. So this vaccine making, uh, are making a lot of trouble. Um, I don't know where they obtain this virus that they, they, they from genotype one, because our very, very well known viruses are present in many, many laboratories. I don't know how they found it, but they found it and they produce this vaccine that are creating a lot of trouble. Even they announced in the website, the sale of this vaccine, you can see here. So this is uh, also complicated, it's, it's going to complicate a lot the fight of our colleagues, our Chinese colleagues against ASF. The other things that also surprised me, at least to me very much in Asia in general, and in particular in China, is that they have a very, high concentration, as you can see here, a very high concentration of wild boar, but they don't report it to many uh, outbreak or, or, or too many cases in wild boar. So look like they still don't realize that the wild boar are terribly important in the transmission of ASF and also in the re using as a reservoir of the virus. You look the color that we have in wild boar that is high, but not as much of the color that they have in Asia. And we have a lot of travel, as I mentioned to you before, and here in Asia, they look like they don't have too much travel. If they declare only around nine to 10 uh, cases in wild boar. That's also surprised me quite a lot because our model, we make a model to evaluate it, how much will be the density of the population. And as you can see, it's relatively very, very high in all this area. So that means that if they play the important role that is played in the wild boar in Europe, they're going to have quite a lot of more trouble in the future. So in China, we can summarize that the main risk factor that they have is two is by education or traditions. That is that some, some people, especially in the family farm, as well as in some backyard farm, they, they, they buy blood and they mix the blood with, with feed and they try, you know, increase the protein with the blood to feed the animals. And also they use soil feeding by traditions from restaurants, from houses, etc. cetera. Some uh, infected or carrier animals can go inside of the slaughterhouse. Infected vehicles has been found, Identify, un unidentified pig transportation has been detected. Low biosecurity in particular, in these two places, family farms and backyard. Also, they have a very wonderful high biosecurity farms in the industrial part, but in these other two family and backyard, very low, no poor or, or no or poor compensations for farmer affected. This is a big mistake because when you don't pay to the farmer that they have or they get ASF is, is a problem because most of these people they, try, they will try to sell as much as possible to not lose everything themselves. So the no compensation in many places that I has been working in eradication and control, I found that no compensation is really a big problem to never finish with the disease. They also have already attenuated the strain circulating, not only from one genotype, but also for the genotype one and, and with a very attenuated strains or isolates, and also a high population of wild boar, but that still has not been, in my opinion, probably correct evaluated 
from the power of this animal, the wild boar, in the keep and transmitting transmission of the disease. So you see, these two things are terrible to use blood because one again, I would like to tell you that just a single drop of blood have more than 3 million copies of the virus. And so that's mean the, the powerful that the blood has and the transmission. So what, that, what they have, in, 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 the, what they have in, in summary is that they are a circle of circulating virus between pig infected pig products infected and swill feeding again, that they are creating this problem that is difficult to stop. I also want to mention a little about the situation that you have more closest to you uh, is the African swine fever in Haiti and Dominican Republic. So in Dominican Republic was the first to declare ASF presentation, but they, they really de detected the disease very late. So very, very late, very, very late. So by the time that they declare the disease, they, they have already a, a very important spread across several provinces and that they continue in, in the time. They have many backyard already and also some of them using soil feed uh, as a very popular type of feed the animals. They start initial problem with the diagnosis at the beginning. They have initial problem with laboratory diagnosis. Now it's running very, very well. But at the beginning we have, they have trouble. It's a matter of fact that the diagnosis was done. The first diagnosis and other has been done out of the, of the country. They have a, a border that is very, very permeable with Haiti. And Haiti, as you know, have a lot of trouble at this moment with the health care, with the killing of the president, with a, a lot of mainly pig backyard, etc. So they have many, many difficulties. So the situation so, so far is not a very strong uh, stop of the disease. They continue moving, probably a little slower, but still moving. So if they, 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 if they continue like that, they will run in to be an endemic countries for a while. So how can we do to be protected? What are the, the most important point that I recommended to all of you? The first thing is to know very well our, our enemy and in particular, the main mechanism of transmissions and be aware of this kind of risk for ourselves. I mean, for our, for our risk, for, for our own risk. Review our biosecurity, our early detection for ASF and our contingency program. This is a very important recommendation because uh, it's very important to see if our veterinarians and farmer will very easily detect the disease or at least, at least suspect about or to have a suspicion about the disease in their own country, as well as a specific good contingency program that can be affected different areas of the countries of American continent countries. Identify the possible clinical signs and clinical lesions. I mean, clinical signs and lesions are very important because this is the base for an early detection. If we don't detect the disease on the farm, if we don't de de detect the disease or the idea, the potential presence of the disease in the farms, it's very difficult to stop the disease easily because the disease is going to spread very quickly. And by the time that you're going to really detect that you have ASF in one area, you're going to see that many farms are affected. So it's very important to review the clinical signs and lesions, also to have an effective laboratory diagnosis and a good and a specific surveillance and contingency program in each country. This is very important and especially specific of each area and, and adapted to the different epidemiological production system, et cetera. I'm going to show you a little how difficult is the virus. This is uh, about our enemy, the virus. ASF virus. First of all, is the, the most complex virus that is still not, no, no one more complex than this one. They have 170 to 190 kilobases. So it's a very, very large virus. 170 genes, only in genes they have 170. You know, there are viruses that are creating us many trouble with only 10 genes, with 20 genes, with 35 genes. 
this had 170. We still don't, don't know well the complex structure of this virus. Still, we don't know what, what is the axions or what is the missions of some of these genes. We still don't know or we don't find yet a very clear proteins that induce neutralizing antibodies. We, we found immunity, but not these neutralizing antibodies that, as you know, is very important for Africa, for viruses in general to block the infection. Also, the virus have a great genetic variability. So that means that there are many different viruses. And because we don't have significant amount of neutralizing antibodies, we cannot classify the virus for serology and different neutralization system. We have to classify the virus and genotypes that are related with changes in one of the most stable protein, little changes in this stable protein to classify the virus and the different genotypes, but not in serotypes. And serotypes are very important in protection. So to do, to study, for example, in our case that we are working a lot in African swine fever vaccine, we have to study the cross protection in vivo because we cannot do uh, in vitro for the lack of this, a good test to evaluate cross protection for the lack of neutralizing. So this is uh, creating trouble, as you know. So the classification of 24 genotypes are based on mainly in one protein that is not related with protection, not either with virulence. So don't confuse genotypes with serotypes when we talk about African swine fever. Now, the transmission route, uh, road, the transmission roads in African swine fever are quite a lot. We have direct road from domestic or wild boar affected animal. We also have the vector as we saw with the African vector. This is a European one. This is Ornithodorus erraticus, also amplify the virus, but also by movements of, you know, different, different products like vehicles not disinfected, by boots, by humans, but many ways. But the most important that is affecting in the history of ASF is the infection through food, soil feeding, through products, in each product, the animal, each product that has been produced with infected materials, with infected meat, and the virus is so resistant that they keep in this product. Only if you cook the product, if you treat it by temperature, high temperature, the, the, the products that are not affected by temperature, not treated with high temperature, are infection, are infected, except the ones that are salty, the one that is treated salty, like the Iberian ham or the Parma ham, that we have a lot of study that prove that with the period of incubation of the ham with the, with the salt, they inactivated the virus. And that is the only product that can be resisted, I mean, not resisting and not infected in the product. The rest of the product keep a long time. So that's mean that the best way to spread the disease is by train, by plane and by, by boat, not the commercial train or plane or, or boat, because they have an, a special system to treatment the, 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 the garbage, but with a small uh, airport, uh, private planes, and also boat for, you know, with containers that they have a different system. All these are very, very dangerous. So at this moment, the biggest, the biggest danger that we have in the transmission of ASF is the big amount of infected products that we have around the world and many different uh, position and countries. This is the most important. But don't forget, it's also in any surface that has been not well disinfected. The only good advantage I can tell you about that is that African swine fever is not too efficient by aerosol transmission. And of course, a lot of less than food and mouth, PRRS, or classical swine fever. So blood is an important issue. Uh, it's important to remember when you go hunting, it's an important, you know, this hunter, for example, it's important when you do a domicile, you know, a, a produce from the and family for, for parties, or when you have uh, meat that became from animal and has been not treated 
by heat system. Why? Because you know, this is a erythrocyte. Here is the virus. The virus attached to the erythrocytes. So that's why in black, the concentration of virus is very, very high. But also is resistant in other environment. In blood, four degree, a four degree, 18 months, also a four degree, 110 days, and chill meat, also 1000, a minor 20. So this is the way how is the resistant all over in many things, in many places, in many products, and in many surfaces. Like for example, in a pig, in a pig pen, can be for a month. It is not disinfected properly. So this is how the virus resists so much. Also, it's very stable in the environment, and it's easy to find it in near the water because you know many animals came to to drink water and they have feces, and in the feces the animal release the virus, the infected animals. Also in carcass, and the carcass can be for long period of time, and if it's it's under degrees, like three or four degrees or seven, even for longer period of time. And this is very important you keep in mind as well. Now, what is in my opinion at this moment, the most danger potential introduction of the virus into a, an area, into a farm, into a country, how I think it's going to be the easy way. The easy way is going to be by the use of soil feeding, even not in farms, could be that people buy some product or bring it from infected country, some product, and they go for a pygmy and later they release the, uh, the, the, the leftover in the pygmy area. And in the pygmy area, as you know, the wild boar are expertise, a high expertise to open the, the places and, you know, the, in the container and take every kind of garbage very easily. So this is a way, so there will be an amplification in wild boar and later from wild boar, they can go to domestic. That is one possibility. The other possibility is that they, they in countries or in areas where they use the swill feeding directly in domestic one. So with this domestic one, they're going to enter the virus here. The early detection is not going to work at all. And, but there are many things in contact between domestic areas. You know, people that buy or sell things in both sides or, or track or people that buy very cheap here and sell the animal in another places. So the entrance by backyard uh, production is very high as well. So this is for me, the two main, main introduction. Of course, life animals is important. Of course, there is other mechanisms, but these two are the, in my opinion at this moment, the ones that are representing the higher risk for the transmission. So we have, of course, be, be carefully with the vehicles, including the owner ones, that is important. We'll, we're going to now review very quickly the acute and subacute form from the clinical point of view, as well from the lesion, as well as for the lesion. So in wild boar or in domestic, what you're going to see is fever, anorexia, fever high, 22, easily. Anorexia, uh, anorexia sky hemorrhagic, skin, excuse me, skin hemorrhagic, breathing problem, digestive problem, incoordinations, even, even some abortions. If it's a pregnant place, there's going to be abortions because the fever is so high. So in the skin, you also can see this erythema in many parts of the body. We're going to see a little more in, in a few minutes. Also diarrhea, sometimes with blood, you know, melena, they, have, they can have that, and epistasis once in a while. Also, the, in, in, in edema in the parpados, edema because it's, uh, you know, they, they don't have good erythrocytes because of the hemorrhagic that the animal has. The lesions that you're going to have more is fever. I mean, not the lesion, but the, the fever can have the following lesions, spleen, large spleen, Kidney with hemorrhagics, lympho nodes is one of the most significant one. Many lympho nodes are going to be affected. Sometimes with like congestions, other like clap, like, like blood clap. Kidney, less than the other two that I mentioned, but petechias in the medullar and cortical area. Hydro, hydrothoras and hydropericardia. Is, is, hydropericardia is very common. The reasons why, 
there is so much liquid and so much hemorrhagic is because the virus is not only replicated and leukocytes and leukocytes and in macrophages, but also is replicated in endothelial cell. So in the endothelial cell, they induce this type of liquid and this type of hemorrhagic that we see here. Look at these lymph nodes. Sometimes it's like that. They don't look like even a lymph nodes, look like a, a clack of, of blood already. And the intestine also with a lot of hemorrhagic. You, you see also pneumonia and also hydrothorax. You can also find hydrothorax, pneumonia. That's why many people confuse sometimes this disease with other. The splenomegaly is a very, very common lesion in Africa swine fever. You will see it easily and also very dark. Uh, the lymph nodes is fantastic. It's, the lesion is, you look at this lymph node, it's unbelievable. So if you open and you see several lymph nodes, you have to think in an ASF for sure. And if you also have petechias, you have a splenomegaly, you know, you have to festival of everything, be sure that it's not ASF. The hydrothorax, as I told you, yeah, they can be more or less blood with, you know, with blood, but hydrothorax is very common. Hydropericaria as well. Hydropericaria, yeah. Hemorrhagic on the intestines, you have outside, inside, and the mucose. You can see it, petechias all over. Okay, this is again hemorrhagic, splenomegalia, hydropericaria. And in the acute form, in the attenuated, excuse me, in the attenuated and chronic form, the situation is very complicated, it's more complicated. You only see some lesion problem, this type of lesion problem. And you, you very more frequently the swill, this swill and, and this, you see this kind of articulations, uh, this, this is more frequently. But this is the only thing, this nothing compared with the other. The animals are surviving more, most of some of them, not most, but you know, between one to four percent to three percent could be carrier of the virus, and they created a lot of more trouble for detection and for stop the spread. Now the sample to send it to the laboratory, the most important are blood and serum, lymph nodes, spleen, lung, and kidney. Also the diagnosis can be established in, in PCR as well as for antibodies detection in oral fluid as well as in feces. We also uh, describe it very recently a sponge that can be good for evaluation in, in surface and in surface, including the animal surface, but also in one farm or in one vehicles that you want to be sure that the virus is not there. So in the advantage of this system, because of the mix of alcoholics that we have, is that uh, once that you wet the sponge and you pass through everything and you put again the sponge in the bottle, the bottle totally inactivated the virus. They keep the DNA active but not the virus. So it's a very safe type of sample to send in anywhere or everywhere. This is how to prepare. You know, it's, it's very easy, very simple. And as I told you, not even the first part of the, of the PCR, that you know is the extractions that are always infected in most of the sample. And this one you can do in a regular laboratory with no trouble. So the laboratory for, for diagnosis is fantastic. We have a fantastic technology for all the different virus laboratory for PCR, uh, for, for virus detection, the most common is PCR because it's quick, it's very specific, it's very sensible. And so the, this is the, the, the ones that we use more. Of course, the first case of one positive one should be also virus isolation. And the virus isolation is in leukocyte or macrophages to make the final reports. And also we have fantastic tests for antibodies detection, like ELISA, like in Western blood, like immunoperoxides, peroxide, many, many tests that are working with high level of sensitivity and specificity. It's important to remember in African swine fever that uh, the early detection is going to be with a big amount of virus. So that's mean very low CTs, very low CTs of the PCR. 
and they're going to keep for quite a, a while period of time, but later they going down. And, and when they going down, most of animals became negative, but a, a few have a sporadic viremia. A sporadic mean that it's not permanent, but once in a while the virus went to the viremia as well. So and in general, the detection for ASF, if it's an early detection, should be used the PCR as a best election of the virus. But if you have a high, you know, a high symptom or lesion for African swine fever and your PCR is negative, I recommend you to do also antibodies and of course to repeat the PCR with other sample. I think this is very, very important to keep in mind because antibodies is exactly the contrary. They keep for longer period of time. So what are the problems that I found more, more normally in areas that are not used to working or to, to show African swine fever lesions? Well, the wrong surveillance program, more, more, more or less, is, is not a good adapted surveillance program for areas that are not familiar with ASF. The late detection and feel, that is very important. There is no good training of veterinary services or farmer. And that's why the detection is very late. No good or incomplete laboratory diagnosis. They only do PCR, but don't do antibodies or they do antibodies and no PCR. The low biosecurity by backyard, especially, I insist to tell you that the no compensation is really a big problem. It's really a big problem. Now, the specific contingency program is very important. So in most countries, they have a very good, a very good contingency program. Compensation is important. And of course, a wonderful collaborations between the private and the public together. Private and public sector have to work together in this type of diseases. There is no a single recipe for ASF, but I can tell you what are the main ingredients, not the recipe, because the situation are so different one place to another that there is not a single recipe. But the most important ingredients is biosecurity, early detection and fast response. This is the clear point to really avoid the introduction or, or stop the introduction or have a high and quick detection. To have a good and a specific contingency plan adapted to the reality not make a, pay, a copy paste of other contingency plan and a continuum and education and training of our veterinarian and our farmers. Now I'm going to tell very few minutes about the vaccine. As you know, several prototypes are already available, but not still commercial. Is are all of them are still under research. We are evaluating most of them, at least our and some other colleagues from the States some other colleagues from Europe as well. Um, they, they have already uh, several prototypes using trial, animal trial for the evaluations. And they are really more close to have a vaccine of ASF than, than never. In our case, because of the problem that I mentioned to you on wild boar, we, we are doing two type of vaccine, one for wild boar and other for domestic one. So both of them are running quite well with a very high promising results. But just to summarize the, before starting to show our, I'm going to tell you that ASL legal vaccine are closed, but they're still not in the market. So don't buy, don't buy, don't, don't feel in that there are other countries already vaccinating. You see what happened in, in China, I show you. So be careful, is known vaccine already approved. Several prototypes from different research groups are already running and many of them very promising, but they're still not ready. More animals are in trial. So we need, because of I mentioned to you for cross protection, for example, we need to vaccinate it and to challenge the animal to be sure that they have cross protection. So we have to do a lot of animals and that's why they take it a little more time for all of, for all of us. So our main objective and our vaccine is security. The second one is efficacy and cross protection. I mean, this is very important. The cross protection is very important, but the security is more important than anything. So we are working, asking for 100% security and we are around 92 to 99 or 100 uh, efficacy already. 
However, oh, oh, I mentioned again, the vaccine is not ready. You see uh, the vaccine in African swine fever for many years, we know that the inactivated doesn't work, don't induce immune response. The subunit vaccine or DNA vaccine doesn't work either. They, they induce very weak immune response. The best, the best vaccines, the best that we have better solutions are the attenuated vaccine, the attenuation vaccine we can obtain between a 92 to 100% of, uh, of efficacy. But the point of this attenuated is the equilibrium between safety and efficacy. And that's why we have to play in our case to make safety the first point and efficacy, even if it's lower, but this safety, we're going to be happy. So the project that I am the honor of coordinator is a European Union project from uh, the, the European Union opened uh, a call for African swine fever vaccine. Several candidates were presented and we was the winner with the Bagdiva project. As I told you, it's three candidates, the one that we have already. Uh, we have several countries uh, from the European Union, as well as from outside of Europe with Russia, China, and here in Kenya with Iri, uh, because we want to test in our vaccine in the Fagochero and in the Buspeak as well. The objective of our projects is safe and effective vaccine for wild boar and pigs to develop a DIVA test and to also show how to uh, use the vaccine in the best way and the different eradication uh, uh, scenarios. So we also have already uh, a, a, a very good HSF control with a nice eradication strategy using vac vaccine. We work in the three objective already in the project. Three prototypes, as I told you, in the natural attenuated ways, uh, as well as in the the Lexion's mutants way. That is uh, for both, for wild boar and for domestic. And, and the results that we have is 92.86 and wild boar. And it's not because this animal was not protected, is that he was not immunized, you know? So we have animals that, because orally, we vaccinated orally, and we try to, to see that the best efficacy with the bait for the maximum immunizations. So we are making increase very much our level with the bait. We have now a beautiful bait that it eat it very well for animals and even they can eat several because they love it. And even if you eat several of these, you don't have trouble. The vaccine is just the same if you take one, but if you take 10, 11 or 20 or 20, whatever, no problem with that. So our level of protection is already 99.9 and to 92.86 in wild boar. And we're going to do a pilot vaccine in Lithuania, other in Kenya. This is what we have in the program, but we also are already evaluating other risk assessment for other areas. And uh, ILRI is to, to see if we can protect it because that will be the best way to stop ASF in Africa. And uh, we have already in several in Europe and this is the status of the different point. As you see, more of, some of them are uh, partially done, but ongoing. Some of them are already finished, but still we are in the progress for at least one year and a half more. But uh, if you want more information of this, I can invite you for a coffee when you have time to come in and visit in us. So this is our dream to change the color that is already full of, you can see in, in ASF, and to have a world free of ASF. I would like to thank you for the invitation uh, for to give this talk to all of you for the participation and, and to be with us to this for your company. And I would like to thank also my university, the OIE, the European Union for founding our research and my team. This is my ASF team, except the epidemiologists that they are out because they was out the day that we took this picture. Thank you very much, and I am ready for your comments or for your question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Manuel Sanchez Viscano. That was a very good presentation. I'll, I want to turn this over to uh, Joe Crenshaw for his talk, and we have several questions that we'll answer uh, here in the okay. next uh, 20 minutes or so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, you.
Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Sanchez, uh, for an excellent presentation. And as Tom mentioned, uh, please be preparing questions in the uh, Q and A uh, session that'll follow my presentation. I want to briefly talk about uh, uh, plasma biosafety and efficient pig production. Uh, uh, and uh, first off, I want to talk a little bit about our manufacturing process for producing spray dried uh, porcine plasma. Uh, we utilize multiple hurdle mitigation technology. And the multiple hurdle mitigation technology is, is commonly applied in uh, food nutrition or food production. It's a concept that uh, goes to the fact that in many cases, multiple low level mitigation uh, steps are used sequentially uh, and are more effective at reducing and eliminating microbes than the sum of the individual hurdle. Uh, so, when we process plasma, there's four key steps uh, that are involved uh, as, in terms of hurdles uh, to help uh, mitigate uh, potential uh, pathogens in, in the raw material. But first, we, we collect blood only from animals that are clinically healthy and fit uh, for slaughter for human consumption. So. We're not out collecting blood just from anywhere. We're collecting it from uh, uh, veterinary inspected facilities, uh, animals that are again, uh, clinically healthy and not uh, uh, clinically sick. Uh, another key step is uh, we've implemented is uh, UVC technology. Uh, ultraviolet light C is known to inactivate uh, multiple pathogens, uh, and it's a step in itself that is uh, shown to help uh, uh, mitigate uh, several viruses, which I'll share with you later. Uh, but uh, UVC uh, is applied to the liquid as it's uh, uh, before it goes into our spray drying process. Excuse me here, something happened. And uh, another key step is spray drying. Uh, our spray drying process uh, heats the final product up to at least 80 degrees C throughout substance. Uh, even OIE is recognized that uh, 80 degrees C throughout substance is effective in eliminating uh, a lot of list A type diseases, including African swine fever. And so our spray drying process is uh, uh, guaranteed to process that temperature at 80 degrees C throughout substance. And then another uh, step in our process involves uh, post drying storage. Uh, after the pack, uh, product is uh, packaged, uh, we store it uh, for 14 days at 20, at least 20 degrees C or higher uh, before it's released for sale. And so uh, to give you a kind of a pictorial view of some of our processes, our uh, UV system uh, is an exclusive uh, UV photo purification system uh, we have helped develop here at APC. And uh, again, the liquid plasma flows through this system and this system is designed to allow for a turbulent flow, ensuring all the plasma is treated with the UV light, and then it's passed on uh, to the spray drying system. The spray dryers, again, uh, are computer controlled. Uh, and again, uh, we're assuring that it's uh, reaching a minimum of 80 degrees uh, outlet temperature, uh, and this is maintained and continuously monitored. Our uh, post drying storage uh, at controlled uh, temperature is also another step. Uh, and this is a picture of one of our warehouses where uh, in wintertime uh, uh, we have insulated storage and a heater controlled system uh, with the uh, therm thermometers recording uh, the temperature to assure that it is uh, maintained at least at 20 degrees C for 14 days. We have done uh, 
several studies uh, looking at the biosafety of plasma where we've intentionally taken uh, a specific virus, uh, inoculated into the liquid plasma, and then uh, either subjected it singularly to uh, UV light, uh, where we can get uh, a log reduction, uh, spray drying by itself, storage at uh, 20 degrees C for 14 days, uh, is where we would take uh, the virus and inoculate it on the dry plasma and show a log reduction. And when you uh, look at uh, these viruses, uh, uh, we've tested several uh, different swine viruses, both uh, DNA and RNA enveloped or envelope type viruses, including African swine fever virus. And, and each step singularly has uh, shown at least a four log or higher reduction. And when you look uh, across the total hurdles, uh, we, we see a, a very high greater than 10 uh, uh, log reduction throughout the process. And so when we think about uh, log reduction, uh, when we think about what that really means, uh, OIE and EPA uh, recognizes that disinfectant should have at least a four log reduction. That means that it's 99%, 0.99% effective in uh, uh, killing or inactivating the virus. If you look at our uh, three uh, key steps, uh, hurdles, uh, we, for example, with African swine fever, uh, again, we're seeing each step has uh, a four plus log reduction, uh, giving us a total of about a 13 log reduction, which is 99.1199 uh, effective in reducing uh, or inactivating African swine fever virus. Uh, some other groups have uh, done some risk assessments. The European Food Safety uh, Agency has uh, recently published a risk assess assessment for African swine fever. And they looked at a, a several potential fomites, including uh, uh, feeds and feed ingredients. Uh, and uh, basically they concluded that the hydrolyzed proteins and blood products ranked lowest of, of all these uh, potential formats, uh, regardless of origin or destination. In summary, uh, spray dry plasma is collected from healthy animals, inspected and passed fit for slaughter for human consumption. Blood is collected and processed in a closed system, preventing cross-contamination. Spray drying plant biosecurity ensures that the finished material does not become contaminated with unprocessed plasma. And third party verification, uh, we've been working with the University of Minnesota as well as uh, AFSA and other groups uh, have uh, evaluated the process and the multiple hurdles uh, used in production. Uh, and uh, to ensure that the, the, the uh, inactivation processes are effective and uh, have generally concluded that spray dry plasma is a safe ingredient to use. So when we think about plasma and its benefits, uh, it can be used as an effective uh, nutritional health tool to, to help improve production efficiency. Uh, plasma contains functional proteins that have biological activity beyond just nutrition. Uh, the functional protein profile in plasma is very similar to that in colostrum and sow milk. Uh, plasma contains functional proteins, including transferrin, lysozyme, growth factors, cytokines, and uh, probably most commonly known as IgG. Uh, and all these, uh, functional proteins uh, maintain their activity even after processing the spray dry product. And so these, our research has shown that uh, collectively these uh, functional proteins do have a profound effect on the animal's immune response and inflammatory response. 
uh, to help them uh, support uh, uh, animal health and production. When we think about uh, stress, uh, whether it's due to environmental or uh, stress or pathogenic stress, uh, uh, plasma uh, animals uh, without plasma uh, have to utilize a lot of their nu nutrients uh, uh, when they're under stress to support the immune system response. Uh, when we're feeding animals with plasma and subjecting them to some kind of challenge, whether it's environmental or pathogen challenge, uh, they get through that process much more efficiently and therefore they're conserving more nutrients than to support growth and production instead of having to support uh, the immune system response. Uh, a recent review uh, uh, has shown that when you compare plasma versus other proteins in diets for, for nursery pigs, uh, you see an incremental improvement in both gain and feed intake up through 40 days post weaning, even though they may or may not feed uh, plasma throughout that whole 40 day period. Uh, so it consistently supports higher growth and intake uh, through that first 40 days post weaning. And this has been well documented in previous reviews as well. Uh, plasma uh, is uh, very effective even in commercial uh, production conditions. Uh, a uh, epidemiological study uh, was done in Canada a few years ago, uh, looking at the odds ratios of plasma in nursery diets associated with high nursery survivability. And what they showed was that plasma in the first or second feed had greater odds, uh, a higher odds ratio of improving nursery survivability than say, weaning weight alone. Uh, other factors including uh, biosecurity, disease status, farm management, uh, nursery nutrition, all significantly benefited herd health and survival. Uh, and inclusion in uh, plasma and nursery diets uh, certainly uh, had a very strong benefit on uh, health and survival under commercial con uh, nursery conditions in Canada. Uh, some people asked if uh, there's a difference between bovine versus porcine plasma. Uh, in our research, uh, we actually see uh, very little difference between bovine or porcine plasma. Uh, in this study, we had uh, two different lots of bovine plasma or two different lots of porcine plasma and I fed it for 14 days after weaning and by day 35, uh, uh, the body weights were very similar among the plasma sources, no differences in all plasma sources, wherever a bovine or porcine origin uh, improved performance over a controlled diet without plasma. We also have uh, done some work uh, and published uh, a few years ago uh, looking at uh, use of bovine plasma in uh, uh, nursery uh, feed programs for pigs that were PERS positive. Uh, this was a fairly large uh, study using almost a thousand pigs in the study. And at the end of the nursery, uh, pigs fed the plasma program were heavier, uh, significantly heavier and had uh, reduced mortality as well. Uh, and uh, in summary, uh, the, the Multiple hurdle biosafety steps we use to manufacture plasma produces a very safe ingredient for use in pig diets. Uh, plasma is a functional protein ingredient that helps pigs to overcome stressful events such as weaning. And bovine plasma for, performs similar to porcine plasma in pig diets. With that, I thank you. And at this time, we'll uh, turn uh, it back over to uh, our panel and uh, we'll try to answer questions you may have. Thanks, Joe, for the presentation. Uh, again, uh, kind of entering now the question and answer period. Uh, 
for yourself and also for uh, Dr. Sanchez Vizcaino. Uh, we do have several questions in the in the Q and A section, so I do appreciate that from the from the attendees. And again, continue to add those as as we go. Um, Dr. Vizcaino, I think one of the one of the first ones that we had was uh, you know, we talked about the feeding of you know squill feeding as being a, a severe significant potential for transmission. And in China and other locations, we know that they've banned that practice, but how effective do you think the ban is? I mean, is it being implemented from your perspective? Yes, uh, good question. Thank you very much, Tom, for the question. I, I think, I think uh, at this moment, we have a lot of virus circulating in many countries, many, many countries, more than the people even thinking about because some of the animals are not well diagnosed. And in some areas and some countries, they don't go and slaughter when they have an outbreak. They try to sell meat or whatever. So there is a lot of meat infected already in the world. And this meat can go around the world by boat, by containers, by many different ways to enter. So the possibility to be introduced by this way in my opinion, at this moment, is the higher one that we have. Yeah. Very good. Could you talk a little bit about uh, the level of heat treatment that would be necessary to inactivate and kill the virus? Do you mean the ASF? Yes, correct. It's not, it's not too much. It's not too much, but they need to be at 60 degrees, 60, 65 degrees. And for, for a half hour, 40 minutes, and in that case, if you, for example, take the products, this is a good question, Tom, because we have to give exit to the people that uh, have to do swill feeding because they don't have money enough and there are people that, you know, family production, etc. So I, I think it's a good point and I, I thanks for the question because it's true that we have the possibility to inactivate it, the virus. To inactivate the virus, if you take the swill feeding and you trade by heat, you know, you just move in like a pup, you know, and you are moving with the temperature for this 40 minutes, 30 hours, depending 70 or 60, and, and, and you, you, you inactivate the ASF. That will be a good system for these areas where they have to do it, yeah. Uh, Joe, I got one for you. Uh, you talked a little bit about the processing technologies that APC is employing the multiple hurdle steps. How are those processes validated? How are we making sure that we're monitoring that? correctly? Well, our process is, uh, like I said, uh, we've done a lot of research, uh, you know, doing specific pathogen challenges. Uh, again, we would inoculate, uh, say, uh, a virus into uh, the plasma and propagate it in the plasma, and then uh, feed that to uh, uh, or, or subject that to our different processes, whether it's UV or whether it's uh, spray drying or, or even post-processing uh, spray dried plasma, we'll inoculate the virus on that. And then we'll go back and try to recover live virus uh, either in a virus isolation process or in uh, a, uh, uh, you know, uh, type, type of study. And then uh, calculate the uh, log reduction in that. We've also taken in past studies uh, and actually fed uh, uh, inoculated plasma, raw inoculated plasma with ASF and uh, fed that to pigs for 14 consecutive days and could not infect them uh, by feed, even with the raw unprocessed plasma, which was a very unique uh, finding, uh, we found if we took that inoculum and injected it into the animal, we could cause the infection. However, uh, uh, feeding it uh, for 14 consecutive days, we couldn't infect the pigs with it. And so there seems to be something pretty unique about plasma that helps uh, mitigate uh, something inherent in plasma that may be somewhat antiviral uh, that uh, is uh, preventing uh, uh, animals from be being infected when they're consuming it orally through the natural uh, eating process. Uh, but uh, a lot of our validation studies that we've done, 
you know, with several different viruses uh, have been peer reviewed, published uh, articles. They're out there now, and we certainly can provide those for you uh, to go into all the, the details of, of the steps. But uh, uh, again, uh, University of Minnesota has been working with us uh, over the last two or three years to validate our processes. Uh, AFSA has looked at this information as well. Uh, and uh, all the, the reviewers and auditors uh, agree that the process is uh, very effective. Very good. Dr. Friscano, I've got one just from my perspective uh, that maybe you can comment on or answer, but as I'm thinking about the, the difficulties with this virus and the, and the diagnosis, uh, you know, I, I think there's a, there's a time lag from when the onset of the virus is in a population to when it's actually identified. Um, is, there, is there something from your perspective that the industry should be doing better to, to manage that, say, 10 to 14 day time lag before we actually can identify that a pig has the, the ASF virus? The, <laughs> the diagnosis of ASF is, is quick. I mean, as a diagnosis, as a diagnosis. What is taking a little more time is the when you want to genotyping or, or sequencing or these kind of things where that is taking a little more time. But in general, the diagnosis is very quick. And so a PCR is, 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 is like a regular PCR for other viruses. And ELISA is also the same time that for other viruses. So the diagnosis in the laboratory is not, is not taking too much time. It's, it's very quick, it's very quick. The problem is that the samples sometimes don't come to the laboratory. The early detection and field is a big problem of ASF. Know the laboratory diagnosis. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Uh, could you talk a little bit about disinfectants and and from your opinion, your side, which ones do you think are are very effective? That's Dr. for me. Biscano. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Doctor uh, Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. There is a fantastic disinfectant. Very, very. You have the classical one that was chemical and not not even commercialized some of them that they still are working, but from the commercial point of view, they are fantastic, fa fantastic disinfectant. Uh, I don't want to tell anyone in particular because I promise you there are several and they are working very, very well. And surface and and uh, and all, all like, uh, you know, in areas that you think are you know, very difficult, they, they are very good, very good, very good. The disinfection in ASF is, is well. The intent of, of products is not intent of clean and disinfection vehicles that most of the people just cleaning, but don't disinfect it or don't give it the time enough of the disinfection uh, work. That's the problem. But the, mm. the products are good, very good. 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 Uh, there's another question here from the, from the attendees. Uh, contaminated grain that's been harvested in endemic areas. Uh, you know, has there been much evidence of, of transmission via that route? And Dr. Viscano. Yeah, endemic areas for, for us is the worst situation. That's why I am a little worried about what is going to happen in the continent, in American continent, because, you know, there are many people that are going to leave these countries, infected countries, and go back to your countries or to free countries, and they don't realize how danger is a product something that they are eating in the hotel or they are eating in the street and nothing happened to them. Why they're going to be worried to take it at home? And these kind of things are very complicated. We have to really inform well the situations of the people in general, especially tourists. And this is very important. The same happened with the people that work in a container boat you know, boats that they don't have too much information about diseases or whatever, they don't inform and they buy products in one country and they later put the garbage in another country and they don't realize the risk that they are really offered to a new country. And this is a, is, is a lack of information. In my opinion, we need more information in general about ASF resistant and ASF mechanism of transmission in the general population especially tourists, especially boats that do, you know, containers, uh, private flights, these kind of things. Very good. 
Uh, Dr. Joe, uh, your, one of your slides had bovine working very similar to porcine plasma with the internal data. Uh, that would appear then that the uh, immunoglobulins are probably less important from species to species. How do you explain the results of similar performance between those products? Well, uh, you know, like I mentioned, uh, plasma is a diverse mixture of functional proteins. And so, uh, you know, the antibody response is not necessarily, you know, the, the uh, IgG uh, component. Uh, when you get into post, post gut closure situations, uh, the uh, specific antibodies, I think, have a certain uh, ability to uh, go across species uh, in terms of their effectiveness. But you also have transferrin, you also have, uh, 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 I, you know, uh, other components, uh, cytokines and things like that, growth factors in, in plasma that uh, retain their biological action after processing. And collectively, these proteins, I think, have a pretty profound impact on how the immune system responds to stress. So in some past work uh, we've done uh, where uh, we've in, uh, injected, uh, let's say, Staph aureus intertoxin B into the, the per interperineum uh, of, of an animal, and that creates a mild intestinal inflammation. Uh, but then we're orally feeding either bovine or porcine plasma. And any, any, in all these cases, we still see a, a very strong modulation of the pro and anti-inflammatory response in the tissue levels of animals, not just in the gut, but we see it in the uh, reproductive tissue. We've seen it in the lung tissue as well. Uh, uh, that uh, something in plasma is uh, really uh, helping uh, modulate that uh, total inflammatory response across the whole body, not just at the gut. So uh, whether you're feeding bovine or porcine plasma, we see these responses across species. Uh, we've done multiple pathogen challenge trials and fed animals diets with either bovine or porcine plasma same species, uh, porcine to porcine or bovine to bovine or, or cross species. Uh, and we still see these uh, uh, improved uh, health indicators, uh, better growth, uh, less uh, diarrhea or uh, uh, things like that uh, across species and better survival. So uh, plasma has a very uh, potent uh, impact on how the immune system responds to the various pathogens. And it doesn't seem to, again, to be that specific to the antibodies that could be contained in plasma. For example, the, the PER study I showed, uh, we were feeding bovine plasma to pigs. We saw better growth. We saw reduced mortality, uh, though you would not find uh, uh, PERS antibodies in bovine plasma cattle don't, don't get uh, uh, PERS virus. So, so again, that's an example of uh, how uh, it seems to work very effectively across species, whether it's bovine or porcine. Very good, thank you. Uh, Dr. Viscano, I've got a couple questions for you. Your opinion of uh, pen side-by-side -side tests, uh, do you think that that could increase the sensitivity of some of the trials? And uh, what the challenge here would be, would it be an issue due to the mandatory notification to OIE of, uh, of a positive result? So I'm assuming this is about uh, field trials, um, yeah. potentially. I, I think these tests are, are very well, if you use for the idea of use a test in the field conditions. I mean, uh, there are many countries or many situations or many areas but the difficulties from the sample to reach the laboratory is going to take too much time. And the people have to take decisions what to do with this farm. Well, I close, I don't close, I in, yes, isolate it, I don't isolate it, what, what to do it. So this kind of tests are beautiful for this type of areas where you need a quick diagnosis, a quick diagnosis and to have message or you, you know to adapt the message according with the risk. 
not with the complete diagnosis because all these positives have to be tested finally at the laboratory for sure, to be sure that this a positive or a negative. But they give you indications. So indications in some places of the world are very important to have in vivo and in situ because you have to do something. You, you need to do a reaction to stop the spread of the disease. And you have to, to you know, base it in something. And these tests are good. They have a very high level of sensitivity, a very high level of, of specificity, but uh, it's important to confirm any new outbreak have to be confirmed in a, a laboratory, everyone. So I think they, they are very useful for what they has been designed. But people have to understand that it's not designed to use in a routine basis. And this is the important, yeah. Good. Uh, question on your opinion of surveilling uh, post-harvest pork products in the meat cases. Could that be a better way of uh, depend than depending on farmers to report the signs of the veterinarian? You mean how to do an official report? Yes, correct. Yeah. Yes, uh, I think this is a big point. This is a good point. Tom, you want to kill me this afternoon because you are <laughs> looking for a good point. <laughs> and this is <laughs> one. <laughs> this is a good point because, uh, you know, many in many areas you said that the, the communication is not fast because the system is not fast. And because the people that really if see, they are seeing the problem and they have already in front of their, the problem are not listening because are not the official people and they have to wait for the official people to go there, to do the necrosis, to send to the laboratory. I agree with the, the question. I think it's very important that we have to simplify the situations when it's needed. And, and I, I think that this is important to do it when it's needed because if you have to do action, it's better to take action. And later the laboratory is going to confirm your action, but you don't should stop any things that coming from one laboratory. The laboratory is going to confirm and it's going to send one guy to, to be sure that this thing is happening or not. But, but, but don't stop the possibility of an early detection. To stop an early detection today in ISF is a disaster. And we, sh we have and we should fight against that. We have to do quick detection, yeah. And later confirmation is no problem confirmation, but if somebody is seeing something and they told you, you have to say, hey, let's do it. Let's confirm. Yeah. Uh, another question for you, Dr. Viscano. Uh, you talked a little bit, I remember in your presentation about the challenges with sending the samples in, uh, you know, either in swabs or in uh, things with alcohol because it inactivates the virus, but you can still find it from a PCR standpoint. You know, are there, are there other process methods or other testing methods that would allow the detection of live virus in those samples at this point? Yeah, yeah. Most of the samples that we receive at the laboratories are live sample. Most of them, you know, the tissue of the animal, the blood of the animal is infected animal. But the problem why we, we found this a solution is because there are places and countries and areas that they don't have the container enough safety to traveling with them. And there are many companies that don't want to put on their plane products that, I mean, they don't know if are infected or not, but they know it's not safe. And mm -hmm. that's why I think, and to have these solutions. I am, when we put this solution uh, already in, in information to everybody, it's not thinking in, in countries that they have good container, good communications, you know, it's not, it's for places what they don't have this security and the and sending a product outside. So to make it easier and to make it safety, this kind of transportation is what I think is very good because it's very sensible either. They take on the surface of an infected area and I am sure that they're going to be positive at the laboratory, but they don't have to send that tissue or blood that is really high contaminated. And this is the point. I am thinking more in the Yata, in the airplane companies and all mm -hmm. these things and in little towns and far away places, this kind of thing is, you know, in general, the diagnosis are many possibilities, but the most important is to use the one that is more adequate for each scenario and give it to each scenario a solution. And I think the sponge 
give a lot of solution in many scenarios in countries that some people don't know that exist, but they exist and they have trouble to, to find a, a safe container or they have trouble to be accepted in one company and one flight company to put the product to fly. And th this is the truth. And so is that the way? Okay, very good. Uh, I always have very tough questions for you. Here's another one. Uh, we <laughs> talked about the ASF vaccine. I mean, the, uh, the challenges with the genetic uh, variability with the ASF virus. Uh, what do you think is the fastest time to get an approved ASF vaccine, and do you think it would be available in big quantities? And I mean, it's a it's a question, obviously, uh, but no one has the answer to. But I'd like your opinion on what you think. My my opinion is that we're going to have vaccine for ASF. The question are two: it's going to be safe in all conditions, and the second one is it's going to immunize the different virus variability that are in the different continents, or it's going to be a universal vaccine. It's going to be a regional vaccine. It's going to be a universal vaccine. This is the two questions. And these two questions need a lot of in vivo experiments. And that's why it's going to take it a little more time to have the answer. But the vaccine is already, I mean, vaccine is a product that vaccinated with a protection of 100%, 92% and safety. We have this product. What we don't have the complete answer is, this product is only for Europe or it's for Europe and for most African countries, or is also valuable for Asia? That's, that's, that's the point that we are running on. Okay, very good. Thank you again. Uh, Joe, maybe we'll jump over to you for a question. Uh, uh, let's say uh, separation and application of various plasma protein fractions that you talked about. I mean, is that a further way to optimize the plasma effect? Well, certainly uh, internally, we've, we've looked at several fractions uh, of plasma, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, at least in, you know, our research uh, suggests there's certainly certain fractions uh, have a, a pretty uh, good biological activity alone relative to uh, intact plasma. Uh, and so, uh, that's something uh, you know uh, in development, uh, and uh, you know we have uh, you know in other industries uh, you know developed uh, uh, you know uh, say a serum fraction or a Ig concentrate fraction uh, uh, in some of our uh, other applications for use, say in uh, milk replacer or colostrum. Uh, supplements and things like that uh, uh, for calves uh, that's available today in in uh, in, in those industries. Uh, but uh, uh, you know uh, we continue looking at different fractions and different components, uh, and uh, uh, feel there's uh, some good activity there. It, it comes down to uh, the bottom line of can we produce it economically? Can we make, you know, and does that fit into the market we're trying to sell it into uh, where it's practical and easy to use? So, so that certainly there are components you can fractionate cover down from, from plasma. Uh, as a whole, we still get uh, a little bit better response using the intact plasma than we do these other fractions uh, by themselves. So, so uh, it, it's still a, uh, you know, a work in progress, I would say. Uh, Dr. Viscano, I have another question here for you. Uh, and I found this interesting as well. So uh, you uh, showed that there could be an ASF vaccine that could be administered orally. Obviously, then that gives us some chance of efficacy in wild boars. Has that type of study or is that application being tried now in Europe already? Or are we still under development? Yeah, we, we have the, you know, the only way to vaccinate the wildlife is orally. We cannot go by injection, intradermic or intramuscular. So we, 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 that's why we are working in the wild boar vaccine with the bait, not with injection. Because uh, we have, uh, we design a system to feed the animal in different areas with this bait and replace the bait when they are finished until the vaccinations will be complete. 
and the, all animal will be well vaccinated. Why to do orally? Because there's no other way to do in wildlife. And there are some experiences that we have here in Europe in, with classical swine fever, when Germany was affected because of the wild boar, they also used the Chinese strain for, Afri for classical swine fever as a vaccine for the wild boar and by bait, and bait the animals. And only in a couple of years, we finished with the disease in the wild boar. So we, we saw that that's happened and that is very efficient and some particular viruses. And we already de described it, that in African swine fever, oral, oral immunization is possible. We found that, that oral immunization is possible. And we found that the doses, the overdoses of vaccine, it doesn't affect the problem. So we are quite safe with this vaccine. And we think it's going to be very useful for the wildlife problem. And the wildlife problem, as you saw, and my presentation is the worst that we have in Europe and probably in Asia as well, even that they are still don't re really related the problem, but uh, it's a big problem. So I, I am completely sure that this is the, be the best way for wild boar vaccination, yes, orally. And to follow up on the wild boar situation in Asia, you showed the maps with the, with the endemic <laughs> population of wild boars like in the China region. Uh, do you think that the government there is, are they, do they acknowledge that that is a big risk or are they are they doing some studies to try to understand the potential safety risks with wild boar in, in specifically in China? I, I don't know what they think. It. I really don't know because uh, I don't think uh, that they noted already how important are the wild boar in the spread of the disease or probably because they have other mechanisms of a spread that are more important even like the swill feeding the use of blood, all these kind of things. And that's why they don't give it too much attention to the wild boar at this moment. And, and, and Europe is just the contrary. We have very high biosecurity. We have good, good knowledge of our farmer to avoid the entrance, but we cannot do nothing with the swill feeding. And, and the wild boar infected with the swill feeding and they jump into the farm. I mean, this is the, the, that's the problem that depending on which other risk you, you have, in Europe, the higher risk is the wild boar in the European Union. And other areas is not the wild boar, it's the swill feeding. And for example, in some East country, it's not the wild boar, it's the swill feeding. And in Asia, I think they have both. They have the swill feeding and they have the wild boar, but they still don't know that. They don't give it the importance that they, yeah. Gotcha. Uh, another question, is there a website uh, that uh, this person can read more about the virus isolation process. Yeah, the virus, uh, the virus of African swine fever from a natural way only is growing up in leukocyte or macrophages of, of pigs. So you need to have that uh, in your laboratory to growing up. So you need to have donors of leukocytes, so blood or macrophages of lung. You, you need animals that will be donated of these tissue cells because are the ones that the virus adapted very quickly. We also have some cell line that the virus can grow in up, but the wild virus is much better leukocytes or macrophages. This is the best way. So from blood leukocyte donors or from lung macrophages donors. And they, this donor, they, you, you purify the macrophages, you separate the macrophages, you put in a, in a tissue wall, you know, a, a plate, and you just put the virus and the virus replicated very quickly in leukocyte and macrophages. This is the best way to do it. So you need to have donor in your laboratory, testing donor to be sure that are negative and no, no problem. And so you, you can do it there, yeah. Very good. Uh, here's the question, I, actually I can feel this one. Uh, is it, do you anticipate uh, spray dried plasma availability to fluctuate based on slaughter numbers? and? And I would say yes. I mean, we see that uh, globally with our uh, manufacturing facilities uh, in certain areas of the world when we see ASF spikes and, and a reduction of, of the pig numbers, uh, places like China or places in Europe. Yes, we definitely do see a, a different availability of the, the processing of the blood because of just low slaughter number, low animal slaughter numbers. Uh, again, this is what YAPC focuses to be a, a global company with our 17 plants so we can access plants from a regulatory perspective to, 
kind of help uh, satisfy the demand in the various regions. When incoming plasma may be low, we can take advantage of production in other regions of the world. Uh, another question for Dr. Viscano, um, and I think this goes back to the to the uh, vaccine availability. Uh, is do you have a best possible case timing of scenario of when they're actually will be legally available? I mean, are, can they be administered now within Europe? When do you think they might be available for China or elsewhere? I think uh, that in the European Union, we never never going to vaccinate the domestic pig. This is a uh, our politic with other infectious diseases similar to ASF, and we we never going to use in in farm in the farm in domestic uh, pig. I think in the European Union we're going to use it for wild boar most, and probably in in West, I mean in the East Europe, probably also in domestic and some particular areas to stop the spread of the disease. But in other countries. Is the only way that they have, especially if you have wild boar infected and domestic infected with no biosecurity, with backyard, with all these things, you need to vaccinate this. This is the Chinese system. The China, China never eradicated any disease. They they use vaccines because with the vaccine they are working well. That's why over there was very common when the vaccine, illegal vaccine, start to be used because at the beginning they detected that the mortality was reduced. So what they need was meat, and they don't care at the beginning too much if the meat that they have already is contaminated or not. They are meat, and, mm -hmm. and these kind of things are important. So every, every well, every part of the world is different. So the, probably the vaccine that today will be not used in the European Union and other countries will be fantastic. So I, I, I cannot answer in a global situation. I can answer in some particular example, as I told you, China and, and, and Europe. China have tradition vaccinated everything and they believe in the vaccine, not in the control and eradication. And they don't care if they have a vaccinated animal that produce slowly, that they, they're not vaccinated because it's no disease. They prefer the vaccine even if they lose a little money, but they still have meat to sell. And, the, and, and we cannot do that. So mm -hmm. you see the... The, the diseases are the same, but the countries are different. So when you work in viral diseases like me, you have to be a little psychiatra and psychologist <laughs> because it's not only to know about the virus, you have to know the application of the virus in different systems. So you, you need to, to understand the sociology of these countries if you want really to be effective. Because if you only think on the virus, you are not effective around the world. You could be effective in one area but not around the world, yeah. Very good, appreciate that. Uh, another question for, uh, for you, Dr. Viscano. Uh, could you talk a two-part question? So are, are insects and rodents, uh, do you consider them a big risk for transmission? And the second part of the question is, uh, if a, on a farm, if, if one, uh, one uh, barn is found to be infected, is eradication of the whole farm needed? <laughs> I Tom, Tom, Tom. Baited, baited <laughs> question, I know. <laughs> okay, let's start with the insects. Uh, the, the, we know that the virus replicated in, in Ornithodorus. We know that. So if you have this type of soft ticks, you probably have to be sure that it's not Ornithodorus. Because in or Ornithodorus, they bite the animal, replicate it, increase the virus, and infect it. And not only that. They can be infectious for more than five years. So the, the, the virus keep alive in this animal for five years, not bite anybody, this, this insect. So it's, be careful with that because it's a very resistant virus. So it's possible and it's important to know what kind of, uh, especially the gen blunt, you know, the, what we call soft ticks. If you have soft ticks, be careful with them. We have to evaluate it very well, which kind of soft tick is. This is in relation with the first question. The second question, I don't, I don't remember, Tom. What was the second question? Uh, uh, the question was, you know, if ASF was found on a, on a particular site oh, yeah, uh, yeah. that maybe had maybe multiple I barns. I got, I got that. That is the question that made me many people and, 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 and many places. If I have an early detection and I kill uh, the animals that are sick and I disinfected well, and I have everything clean, why not keep it the rest? And I said, 
what are you doing to be testing that you only have the virus in here? How do you know? How do you know that this animal, the person that has been working with you was not moving there or was not moving at the other place before you have a clinical picture? And most of the cases is that people are moving, not only in one part of the farm, it's moving all over. The guy of the food, the guy of the many, many, many movements. So if you are infected in one area, you will be infected for sure, for sure. That's for sure, because the virus, you at the beginning is not explosive. ASF virus is not explosive. You don't expect it to have 100 dead the first day. You're going to have four, five, six. And by the time you detect it, you put the virus with your, with your shoes in many different places. The second point that is important in relation with that is that you cannot uh, not make a good, a good starting again of production if you are not completely sure that the, the place is disinfected, perfectly disinfected. So, and the only way to do that is of course with the sponge. The sponge will help you because it's many sur surface to evaluate it. But the most important is to use sentinel animals, sentinel animals. And the people, you know, piglets, you put a couple mm -hmm. piglets, you know, like 10 piglets or 11, depending on the size. And the piglets move, move all over and freedom around and you monitoring these piglets with serology and with PCR to be sure that they are not getting virus at all. This is the best way, because I promise you that the question that this guy asked you is the question that the Chinese are asking themselves many years, and they mm -hmm. do, don't believe it. And they have continuing, continual reinfection, continual reinfection. And what's happened in China? You reinfected, but they sell that. So they don't lose so much money. So they lose more money if they are fortify the control, the biological control, etc., because they normally take 40 days with no production. And so in that particular places where you sell the meat because they need meat and they don't want to import, in that case, they people said, okay, for me it's better. Okay, me, my animals are not too good. They are they I I spend more time to produce the kilogram, etc. But I sell it. And I don't care if I reinfected myself in 45 days, because in 45 days, I, I have to clean and disinfect it and testing. I'm going to be dead because I don't make money enough. And that's the problem, you see? So it's not a good answer for everyone. It's a, yeah. <laughs> every situation, it's a little different. Yeah, agreed. And I think that's, that's the challenge we see here, right in the Western hemisphere now that we have ASF back after 40 years in the Dominican Republic and Haiti. <laughs> You know how how in your opinion how how will they how should they manage that? I mean, I know that they've been trying to eradicate some pigs and and, and along those lines, but uh, from a risk profile perspective, what what would be should be the right way to approach that in those two countries? Your yeah, opinion? In my, in my opinion, yes. In my opinion, situation where you have so many backyard and so much virus circulating. If you keep the backyard and the virus circulating, you're never going to finish with the disease. And sooner or later, even the very high biosecurity industrial fund are going to be infected because the amount of virus circulating is going to be so high that at the end, even the wonderful biosecurity is going to be you know, infected as well. So the best thing is really to have a very strong biosecurity in the industrial farm and protect it a lot and, and, and be very severe with the backyard farms and the family farm to be sure that there is no one with virus there. Even supply the pigs from the industrial farm, but not keep it there, people, at least we are sure that there's no virus circulating in the country. But this, this, this solutions that from the virological point of view and epidemiological point of view is the logical one, is not the logical one from the sociological point of view. And from people that are very poor, and they need to have this pig and they don't trust you. They sell that you're going to bring not only one pig, three pigs every week. And all this sociology is what make it very complicated. So the control of the diseases in most cases is not only the problem of the disease itself, it's the environment what the diseases involve. And in some places, you know, the authorities, the people that have to take the decision, they understand me perfectly when I explain you, like I explained to you, but they cannot afford that from the political point of view or from the sociological point of view. 
And this is the problem when you combine science with sociology and with human feeling, it's very complicated. Yeah, it's a very difficult, challenging situation from all, from all perspectives. I agree. Mm -hmm. Well, we've only got a couple minutes left here. Um, Joe, I had just one, one more for you uh, real quick yeah. here, but it, it was a question about, um, uh, let me go back to where I, where I found that one at. Uh, here we go. Uh, can you just talk briefly about the ability of, of spray dried plasma to impact uh, the immunity and, and in its relation to the uh, zinc oxide uh, scenarios that we see in Europe and the rest, other, other countries that are coming? Yeah, certainly uh, uh, there's a recent uh, publication from the Danish, uh, uh, you know, in, in Europe, uh, they're going to uh, eliminate the use of high levels of zinc oxide, you know, for helping control uh, uh, E. coli related diarrhea uh, in uh, starting in 2023, I believe, or late 2022. Uh, and, um, of course, they all have already eliminated a lot of the in-feed antibiotics uh, use as well. Uh, so the Danish are now reckon, uh, recommending uh, using at least 5% plasma in that uh, feed uh, in the absence of zinc oxide uh, availability. Uh, in the uh, plasma, we've done several challenge trials over the past few years, uh, looking specifically at E. coli and uh, uh, both uh, K88 and F18. And when we're feeding animals uh, plasma in the feed, we, we see uh, less diarrhea, less mortality, less, uh, uh, you know, and better growth rate in, in, in pigs uh, fed plasma under an E. coli challenge scenario even in with or without antibiotics and uh, or with and without zinc oxide. So, so uh, uh, again, uh, plasma is certainly uh, positioned well, I think, to fit into to those scenarios for sure. Thanks, Joe. Uh, one more question for you, Dr. Viscano on the Q&A side of things. Uh, go, kind of goes back to the swill, swill feeding uh, in, in a lot of the Asian markets. Uh, do you see a credible collection treatment system whereby swill feeding could be made safe for, for an ASF risk? And what, yes. what would that look like? Yes, there are, there are countries like Japan, for example. In Japan, they keep the swill feeding uh, as a normal way of feed animals, but they have to be treated in several places. So the Japanese has produced and different areas of pig production, especially family pig production and big jar, they produce this system that they inactivated the product and they give it to, to, the, to the farmer to use it. Uh, it's swill feeding, but it's inactivated swill feeding. So it's possible to do, it's cheap to do, it's not very expensive, and it's one of the best way to solving a social problem and a cultural problem. I, I think it's, it's good that question and, and there is solution for that in countries that are doing that normally. And I have to ask you one favor, Tom. I have yes. to pick up a train. I have yes, to pick nope. up a train. So, I totally so, agree. So we're we're gonna wrap up here. I, I wanna thank our speakers so, and especially Dr. Vizcano because I know you have you, a very Dr. busy schedule. So okay. thank you very thank much you. for thank the you. time. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Tom. Thank, thank you, Joe. Thank, thank you for you. the invitation. Safe, have a good travels. day. Bye-bye. Safe hey. travel. Bye. Thank you very much. Again, uh, I think uh, we had a very good, very good webinar today. I appreciate the attendance of everybody and the questions that were there. I think we'll provide a uh, link to the recording uh, for those that want to go back and review some of the uh, information and also the question and answer period. So with that, uh, we're going to, going to end a little bit ahead of time, which is fine. And again, appreciate everyone's attendance. Thank you very much. Thank you.